Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this course in Phonetics and Phonology, a broad overview, an NPTO MOOC course. I am Shakuntala Mahanta and I am continuing with the earlier classes on articulatory phonetics, acoustic phonetics and in this unit you have been exposed to the variety of sounds in the world's languages. This is the third and final unit of sounds of the world's languages where we are talking about diversity in the world's languages. So, most of the unit is based on Ladifugid and Madison 1996, the sounds of the world's languages and we have uh, so far looked at language endangerment and the threat to linguistic diversity and how a great amount of phonetic diversity will be lost once more and more languages disappear. We have also summarized in the last class about sounds of the world's languages, how there are a wide variety of sounds apart from the sounds that you saw when we looked at English which covered only a few labial, coronal and dorsal sounds. If you look at the languages of the world then we find a wide variety among labial sounds where we can have bilabial, labiodental. Among the laminal sounds, we can have lingolabial, the interdental, you know, laminal dental, laminal alveolar, laminal postalveolar. Among apical sounds, we have apical dental, apical alveolar, apical postalveolar, subapical retroflex sounds, and also dorsal sounds. Among the dorsal sounds, we have palatal, velar, uvula. In radical, we have pharyngeal and epiglottal, and also in the laryngeal sounds, we have glottal stops. So, um, after summarizing uh, this, we also said that the state of the glottis can be a, a few other states apart from the basic voiced and voiceless states. So, um, apart from voiced and voiceless, we can have laryngealized sounds, we can have breathy sounds, etc. So, talking about the state of the glottis what we will now call phonation and phonation involves couple of different types of sounds. Phonation can give um, a special quality to vowels and consonants. So, when we talk about phonation we have normal voicing which is called modal voicing in which air passes through the glottis with some moderate constriction and vocal cord vibration of course and regularly spaced normal vibration with glottal pulses. Unlike that we have we can have creaky and breathy which is which can also be called murmur uh, the breathy sound and the creaky involves air passing through the glottis with a smaller constriction and irregularly paced glottal pulses. So, uh, in breathy sounds airflow is greater and there is a noisier component in that sound. So, we will look at these differences in this uh, lecture and also look at how um, vowels uh, can be different in languages of the world and after that we will wrap up this unit on the sounds of the world's languages. So, talking about phonation, some people have different phonation while speaking. So, uh, you can hear that some people use their glottis to produce more breathy sounds, more creaky sounds, so it depends on uh, so, uh, that those properties which can be very idiosyncratic can actually be linguistically distinguished in some languages and when that happens that is called phonation. So, 
Uh, most of this uh, section on phonation is based on Gordon and Ladefoget paper. And just as we had just said that people can control the glottis to produce harsh, soft and also different phonation types and those are controllable variations. Uh, we will talk about those controllable variations also very soon. However, uh, there can be some uncontrollable pathological voice quality and what is pathological uh, voice quality for one person actually could be a phonological contrast for some other languages. So, this is uh, the cross linguistic distribution of phonation contrast that you see in front of you. This is from Ladifugin 1971, we see this is a simplistic diagram of the continuum of phonation types. So, where you see uh, the most open. So, this is all this is defined in terms of the aperture between the arytenoid cartilages of the larynx. So, here when the aperture is as most open we have a voiceless sound and we know that in uh, sound like per versus bur the different based on voicing. But in between those um, two between voiceless and modal voicing between per and bur, we can have breathy sounds where the aperture is not as open as voiceless, but not as close as modal and uh, there can be some amount of noise which can be called breathiness. And between glottal closure for a glottal stop and the modal voice and on one extent we, we have the most closed uh, gesture of, of the larynx of the two vocal cords um, in the most closed gesture and between the modal voicing we can have creaky phonation. So, now we can see that between voiceless modal and glottal closure we can have two very distinct uh, phonation properties and languages there are languages of the world which contrast based on those places in between in the continuum of phonation uh, types. So, the two points uh, employed by the majority of the languages for making a distinction in terms of the glottal state is voice versus voiceless sounds. And the contrast is very clear in stop consonants also uh, other obstruents. In a smaller set of languages we have voice versus voiceless contrast and um, in Burmese and we had already played these sounds before for Burmese voiceless nasals. Uh, now, coming to breathy voiced. Breathy phonation is characterized by vocal cords that are fairly abducted. So, we now from the continuum that you just saw, we saw that breathy occurs between the most open and the modal voicing. So, they have little longitudinal in the, 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 in the kind of tension that there is and they are fairly open not as open as voiceless fairly open and have some tension. Some languages contrast breathy voice and regular voice regular modal voice sounds. So, the examples that I will play here are from Newar. So, you hear this modal voice Ma. versus this breathy voice Ma. and uh, some languages um, contrast breathy voice and regular modal voice sounds which you just heard uh, from Newar. We have Ma which is garland and the breathy voice Ma which is be unwilling. So, um, now let us look at the waveforms as to how they are different. The waveform for the breathy voice nasal is characterized by a fair amount of noisy energy and that we had already mentioned and the modal voice nasal is not marked by this turbulence and has relatively well defined pitch pulses. This is the difference in terms of the spectrograms. You see that you have fairly well defined pitch pulses for the modal voice nasal and irregularly paced at least till the half of the sound for 
and then the regular pace starts. And also, if you look at the waveform, the breathy voice, uh, the difference uh, you can see around the transition to the vowel, you can see around 150 hertz. So, Newar also makes breathy versus modal voice contrast in stops. And there are very many languages which have breathy voice obstruents and are relatively, uh, even though that is relatively rare cross linguistically, this is uh, common in South Asia and uh, quite a few of the largest big languages like Hindi, Methali, uh, etcetera have uh, breathy voice obstruents and the contrast between breathy and modal voice stops. So, two sounds that I will play between the difference between modal voice and breathy voice. These two examples are from Gujarati. So, this is modal voice and this is breathy voice. Now, moving on to creaky voice which you saw in that continuum occurs between the most closed in the glottal aperture and between modal and, and the closed gesture, uh, we have creaky voice which is also called vocal fry. It is associated with vocal folds that are very tightly abducted. Remember that breathy was not very abducted, this is very tightly abducted, but open enough to allow for some voicing. So, the result is a series of irregularly spaced voiced pulses that uh, give the impression of a series of taps like um, uh, you can imagine what a series of taps will sound like with the sound which sounds like tuck, tuck, tuck. So, that is a, uh, a tap series of tap sounds. Contrasts between creaky and modal voice are rare in obstruents and Hausa and some other Chadic languages make uh, such a contrast for stops. So, these are Kala examples from Boas uh, 1947 and you can see the spectrogram and waveforms here of creaky and modal voice nasals. So, let us uh, important to um, see here is the difference between the irregularly paced pulses here and the regular pulses here. So, irregularly paced pulses are a distinguishing feature for creaky voice. So, irregularly spaced pitch periods which you just saw and decreased acoustic intensity which you will also see here, the decrease in, in, uh, in the acoustic intensity here. And there are fewer pitch periods per second in the creaky token than in a modal one. So, lowered fundamental frequency is one characteristic for the creaky nasal. In the spectrogram also, we saw that the creak is realized in the beginning of a, a voice of the voice nasal. And uh, something very important when you talk about phonation is that there is a localization of these aspects of phonation. So, which means that it only is it is localized to a certain part of the vowel or nasal. Creaky voice. Creaky voicing is found among vowels in certain languages and Halapa Mazatek has a three way phonation contrast and we will play the breathy voiced and the creaky voiced examples here. versus the creaky voice. So, what, what are the characteristics of uh, these types of phonation? Breathy voice and creaky voice vowels are characterized by decreased intensity and lowered fundamental frequency. So, the breathy voice vowel is marked by a very substantial turbulent energy. And in the spectrograms above, so we can see that uh, here we have three examples of Halapa Mazatek and we see that um, first we have the breathy voiced and then the creaky voiced vowels. So, 
we can see lower intensity for both unlike the, um, the first one uh, here in the, in the vowels we see the intensity, but here uh, wherever we have the creaky voice the intensity goes down creaky and breathy um, and uh, the breathy voice is also marked by uh, turbulent energy. So, uh, this is the model and breathy and creaky we see the energy going down and we also see that the breathy voice has more turbulent energy unlike the creaky voice. Uh, the breathy pulse of the breathy vowel is largely localized to the first portion of the vowel as you can see and in the creaky voice also creakiness is pronounced during the middle part of the vowel we can see it here as um, reflected in the widely spaced vertical striations reflecting lowered fundamental frequency. So, the lowered fundamental frequency irregularly paced vertical striations these are the common properties of creaky voice. So, um, unlike that in the continuum if you remember the glottal stop is the last in terms of its aperture closure and so complete glottal closure entails an absence of vocal fold vibration as it occurs in the middle of the English interjection. So, um, it is uh, common in English interjections glottal stops um, also occurs in English contrasting with oral stops sometimes um, in English they are not contrastive in other languages they are contrastive with other stops. So, um, there can be also allophonic non-modal phonation and um, like in English the glottal stop it can be uh, allophonic and there can be variants of modal phonation in different contexts and segmentally conditioned allophonic non-modal phonation in vowels is extremely common. So, allophonic breathiness is characterized characteristically found on vowels adjacent to the sound her and also allophonic creak is often associated with vowels adjacent to a glottal stop. So, these are these occur allophonically which means they are determined by the context. Non-modal phonation especially creaky voice is commonly used cross linguistically as a marker of prosodic boundaries either initially or finally. So, uh, as we had just we, as we had mentioned in the beginning of the talk there are conditionally determined occurrences of phonation and now we can see that prosodic boundaries are also some conditions which allow for the occurrence of phonation differences. And vowel initial words frequently have creaky onset in many languages. Again the uh, recall the halapa mazatek creakiness and breathiness that we saw and the, that it is localized to only a portion of the vowel. And um, there are, have been many analysis of this and Silverman links um, this to the confinement of non-modal phonation to a portion of vowels and the use of contrastive tone in halapa mazatek which halapa mazatek also has tones and this is a sort of a trade off. A hoopa has morphologically contrastive timing difference between pre glottalized nasals in pre vocalic position and post glottalized nasals in pre consonantal and final position. Pre glottalized sonorants appear in root final position of stems while post glottalized nasals occur in consonant final stems. So, there can be those differences as well the timing of non-modal phonation in consonants. It can be either pre-glottalized or post-glottalized. In the pre-glottalized nasal on the left as we can see this uh, the creak is realized primarily on the end of the preceding vowel and in the post-glottalized nasal at the end of the word creak is realized at the end of the 
Villarnezo here. So, as we had also already mentioned, creaky phonation is associated with aperiodic glottal pulses. And the degree of aperiodicity in the glottal source is quantified by measuring jitter, this is a variation in the duration of successive fundamental frequency cycles. And uh, jitter values are higher during creaky phonation and um, then other phonation types and breathiness is characterized by increased spectral noise. And breathy phonation is associated with a decrease in overall acoustic intensity in many languages. We already saw that decrease in acoustic intensity. Creakiness also triggers a reduction in intensity. We already saw the decrease in acoustic energy and the decrease in overall intensity is also seen in many languages. Another important property we talk about when we talk about phonation is what is known as spectral tilt. Spectral tilt is a degree to which intensity drops off as frequency increases. That is uh, how do we quantify spectral tilt? We calculate the amplitude, relative amplitude and compare it with that of higher frequency harmonics. That is the harmonics closest to F1 and harmonic closest to F2, we compare that with the amplitude. And when we compare that with the amplitude, we find that the spectral tilt is mostly positive for creaky vowels and steeply negative for breathy vowels. And spectral tilt also differentiates phonation types in a number of languages. So, now uh, talking about the differences in um, different languages with regard to phonetic properties associated with phonation types, we find that Gujarati contrasts breathy and modal vowels, Kadang contrasts modal and breathy vowels, and Hmong distinguishes breathy and modal vowels, and also Songa contrasts breathy and modal nasals. So, now if we look at this uh, spectra, modal, breathy and creaky are and we see what we have been talking about with regard to spectral tilt. In the creaky vowel, the amplitude of the second harmonic, so this is breathy, modal and creaky. In the creaky one, we see this is the second harmonic and the second harmonic is slightly greater than that of the fundamental. We can see the fundamental here and all this information is possible only if we look at the spectra and not at the spectrogram. So, which means we need the information with regard to the harmonics. If you go back to your acoustic classes, recall that for all the information regarding harmonics, we have to take into account the spectra and not the spectrogram. So, this is TFFT spectra and if we look at the harmonics, we see that H2 is higher than the fundamental. In the breathy vowel, the amplitude of the second harmonic is considerably less than that of the fundamental. The modal vowel occupies middle ground and uh, here between creaky and uh, breathy vowels. And this is a breathy vowel, so the harmonic closes to F1, this is the F1 and the, uh, the harmonic closest to F1 has much lower amplitude than that of the fundamental. So, here is the fundamental and here is the F1 and the harmonic here is much lower. In the creaky vowel, the harmonic closest to F1 has much greater amplitude as we can see. And in the modal vowel, the modal vowel is intermediate. So, F1, this regularly paced striations as we can see, the harmonics are much more regular than the breathy and creaky and uh, in the, uh, the modal vowel is intermediate characterized by similar amplitude values for the fundamental and F1. Whereas, you see quite a bit of difference between the fundamental and F1 for the breathy one 
and in the creaky one the f1 is higher than the fundamental in the breathy vowel we see that the f1 is lower than the fundamental whereas in the modal voicing we see f1 and fundamental are pretty close to each other so this information is very considered this acoustic information is considered very important in distinguishing the differences between breathy modal and creaky even though we initially saw that the there was a continuum which was proposed based on the aperture but as you can see we need more fine grained acoustic information to distinguish between these phonation types. So, um, non-modal phonation types are associated with lowering of fundamental frequency and something important to remember is that this lowering effect is not universal as some languages have developed high tone as a reflex of glottal construction. So, there are interactions with tone which we have to remember and breathy phonation is more consistently associated with lower tone in a majority of languages and that is why when we look at tone we also very often look at phonation and how they interact, how these properties of harmonics and their amplitude how they interact is important. And when you talk about formants F1 for frequency values for F1 are higher during creaky phonation than either breathy or modal. And um, Madison and Ladifugate in 1985 found raised F1 values for tense vowels in Haoni and conversely Thongkum found breathiness in 1988 found breathiness associated with lowering of F1 and breathy vowels have lower F1 and F2 values than modal voicing in Kedang. Increased duration is another property of non-modal phonation and breathy vowels are longer than modal vowels, creaky vowels are also longer than modal vowels and non-modal phonation may occur on phonemic long vowels, but not on phonemic short vowels because of the property of length associated with it. So, there are other aerodynamic properties associated, tense vowels in four languages are generally associated with less airflow for a given subglottal pressure than lax vowels and tense vowels are associated with more constricted glottis that allows less airflow. Concluding all these um, uh, properties that we just saw articulatory acoustic etcetera, many languages employ distinctions that rely on differences in voice quality and these distinctions may involve two or more different types and may affect vowels, consonants or both consonants and vowels. Other languages use non-modal phonation types as variants of modal voice in certain prosodic contexts and uh, languages differ in the timing of non-modal phonation relative to other articulatory events and differences in phonation type can be signaled by a large number of quantifiable phonetic properties in their acoustic aerodynamic and articulatory domains. So, uh, coming now to vowel inventories. So, we have now uh, finished discussing most of the aspects of consonants. We have finished discussing about place of articulation, manner of articulation, um, airstream mechanism, direction of airstream, nasality, lateral, central um, aspects of sound and nasality is another aspects of another aspect of consonants. So, we have talked about all these dimensions in the production of consonants. Now, looking at vowel inventories, we can say that the, the vowel inventories that we talked about in when we talked about uh, articulatory phonetics. So, remember the triangular shape that we talked about when we talked about cardinal vowels and we talked about cardinal vowels and how the outer edges have the most common uh, vowels in the language of the world. So, the triangular part is most common if you remember what is the triangular if you recall the vowel um, diagram then you will remember that the two edges on of the high vowel are the 
E and U, one is front, one is back. And what is triangular? It is the one which is at the bottom, which is R versus vertical systems where you have a contrast between front and back and high and low vowels in each of the corners of the vowel diagram. So, height contrast is important and roundedness is not preferred for contrast. A small minority of languages have front rounded, rounded or back rounded vowels, unrounded vowels. There is also nasalization, pharyngealization and length when you talk about different vowel inventories in the languages of the world. So, uh, what are pragmatic requirements? So, Madison says that pervasive pragmatic requirements for efficient communication and better balance between ease, relative ease of articulation and relative perceptual salience determines the uh, vowel inventory of languages. So, that is why the, the triangular shape is most common and apart from that if we add two more vowels to the triangular shape then we have two mid vowels contrasting in front and back. So, some properties which are um, not so commonly seen um, are front vowel rounding, nasal vowels and central vowels. So, we have uh, the front, central, back and um, uh, this is the vowel um, diagram if you recall and these are the cardinal vowels and we uh, have discussed extensively how we determine the differences between the cardinal vowels and what are the most important properties when you, when you talk about vowels with regard to their height, their frontness, backness and uh, roundedness which are the most important properties and why the uh, vowels are spaced like they are in the cardinal vowel set. So, uh, we will not go into those things, we will just talk about a few uncommon properties. So, Dutch has vowels that are both front and round. Beat. 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 Bit, bait, bait, boat, 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 bet, 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 bet. So, among these vowels, these are the rounded vowels in Dutch, and this is the round front vowel in Dutch and also the round front high vowel and this is the round front and mid vowel and then we have these other vowels which are rounded by the back. Okay. So, Vietnamese has uh, vowels that are back uh. round rounded and these are the examples. Uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Un, un. So, these are uncommon combinations for vowels and should not seen very often that is front and rounded, back and unrounded and but there are languages which show both. So, um, nasalized vowels, so in some languages vowels can be nasalized, you can hear this contrast from French. Low, 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 low. So, this is the oral vowel la, la. that is the nasal vowel. So, that is the difference between oral and nasal in French. So, um, the other property which is important is that of length and it is seen in vowels and consonants you see in gemination, but there are languages which have both vowel and consonant lengthening and Japanese is one of those examples. Um, finally, uh, when we talk about a variety of um, sounds in the languages of the world, the one aspect which we have not talked about at all is tone. So, uh, the reason we have not talked about 
tone is because we have an entire unit devoted to tone. So, what is tone when pitch enters into a lexical distinction which means when two words are different entirely based on pitch. There are many complications to this assertion we will talk about those things when we talk about tone and apart from um, lexical distinction which you just talked about most important thing is that the uh, presence of different of two of uh, uh, change in pitch also signals a meaning difference and that is why tone languages are different from non tonal languages which do not make such a linguistic use of pitch. So, there are more tone languages in the world than non tonal languages Mandarin has five tones Mandarin, Cantonese and many languages other languages in uh, spoken in various parts of the world irrespective of regional differences ha have tone and there are many aspects that of, of this um, aspect of pitch that has to be studied and uh, linguists uh, study this to a large extent. There are many um, aspects of tone that we need to study about which we will probably not be able to cover in this course, but we will definitely in the um, last unit we will cover uh, tone and intonation and discuss many aspects of tone and also another aspect of pitch called intonation. So, thank you for listening. We will start the next unit from the next lecture. Thank you.